Welcome in to the 2024 Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. Yeah, you can have Penix, Patricia. <laughs> Who says I want him? I had to put a chip down of one player in this draft to go to the Hall of Fame. Who's my pick? And it's Marvin Harrison Jr. The Locked On Podcast Network presents the 2024 NFL Mock Draft Special. Sponsored by LinkedIn. Welcome to the finale of the 2024 Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special, episode six of six. We made it, taking you through the entire first round of the NFL draft and a few extra picks for those teams that did not select in the first 32. Unparalleled insight from the local experts of all 32 teams here at the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and don't worry if your favorite team didn't select or moved out of the first round we've got you covered every team's top selection an inside look from all 32 of our local hosts here in this six episode extravaganza hearing from our college shows locked on fantasy experts for some of the bigger selections and of course the draft dudes joe and kyle standing by in the locked on nfl scouting war room as well and of course the 2024 Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special, sponsored by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL terms and conditions apply. And it is the Detroit Lions to lead us off in this final episode, guys. Pick 29. We'll hear from the Cleveland Browns and the Carolina Panthers and the Houston Texans and the Buffalo Bills as well, who did not have a first-round picks. Who knows? They, they might still sneak back into the end of the first round here in the last few selections of round one. The Detroit Lions have been doing a lot of work. They're ready to go win themselves a title in Detroit, guys. Uh, what player on the board, Damian? I want to go to you because we've referenced your 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 draft board so many times here during the course of this first round mock. Is there anybody that still made first round grades for you that is on the board at, at 29 of your top 24 clean first round prospects? And and where do you see the Detroit Lions going here at 29? Yeah, I mean, Cooley McKinstry, the cornerback out of Alabama, is still on the board. Got to definitely have a first round grade on. Amarius uh, Mims, the tackle out of Georgia, uh, you know. At six eight three forty, athletic, powerful young man. Uh, I think with the Detroit Lions secondary, I know they they traded for I think Colton Davis, uh, with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But uh, Cam Sutton, you know the legal issue there, he's no longer on the team. They need cornerback help, and I think even with those two, if if they still had Cam Sutton, I still think they need a cornerback help. So I think the secondary should probably be one of their top priorities here uh, in the first round. Emmanuel Mosley as well. One year contracts. Corner seems like a huge need. Kool Aid McKinstry still on the board. Keith, you're a big fan of Kool Aid, right? Oh, definitely. Like I said, man, consistent press man corner. And the thing that the Lions, the position that the Lions are in is that, hey, if they just simply take anybody on the defense, right, it's an upgrade for them. So I think they're in a really good spot, whether that's, you know, you want to go edge rusher, you want to go corner, you want to go linebacker. Just make sure that he's a defensive player to be able to improve this defense for the Detroit Lions. Matt, any glaring players that made it through the first five episodes of our mock draft that are still on the board for you here in the in late round one? I think we mentioned Mims. I mean, his immense talent stands out to me. Um, I thought somebody, it, it wouldn't have been me, would have jumped on Xavier Worthy just because he has, you know, a, a, a trait that few do. I, I think McKinstry makes a ton of sense for Detroit here, but just want to throw out one thing. I mean, Jamison Williams hasn't exactly worked out as planned. Could they get off one more weapon in that dome that can run? Yeah, but would you want to add a, another skinny fast guy to the mix? Or are yeah, you, I don't know if it'd be Worthy or McConkey or Franklin yeah. or even Coleman or, you know, just one more pass catcher, I think, will be maybe a day two thing. Still a lot of flavors of wide receiver on the board here. And so maybe this is a this is a run for some of those players as well, a lot of ways that Matt Derry could go with the Detroit Lions at pick number 29 in the Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. So let's find out. Locked On Lions War Room, Matt Derry, ready to go with pick 29. With the 29th pick in the Locked On NFL Mock Draft, the Detroit Lions select Kool Aid McKinstry, cornerback from Alabama. If you look at the Lions' current situation at cornerback, it's interesting. General Manager Brad Holmes says there's no urgency to bring in another cornerback after picking up the likes of Carlton Davis and Amik Robertson in free agency and re-signing Emmanuel Mosley. But now that Cam Sutton is gone, 
The Lions do have another uh, open spot or two to bring in another cornerback. Dan Campbell feels like the Lions definitely need to add another corner. Kool-Aid McKinstry, best player on their board at 29, and that's why I feel like the Lions would snag him. Really good football player, had some very, very good years at Alabama. Good size, good speed, and certainly with the Lions and Aaron Glenn's defense wanting to be aggressive with their cornerbacks, McKinstry could be a fit. Now, do I love making this pick for Detroit? No, I don't. I think there's a good chance the Lions trade back. Also, they'd love to add to their offensive and defensive lines, and if receiver that they love is at 29, the Lions would take one. But at this mock draft, we go with McKinstry at 29 for Detroit. You know, I think Matt Derry should love taking Kool-Aid McKinstry here. Matt, what do you think? I, I, I like that the Lions have been working on their secondary for a while, trying to prevent teams from scoring on them. Uh, it's one of the few pieces this team really needs. And Kool-Aid McKinstry, while he might not be a dynamic athlete, man, he's plug and play and he's ready to go from week one. Yeah, that's what I like about him for a team that was a Final Four team last year, has Super Bowl aspirations, that they need a project that it might take half the season or a whole year or so that has higher upside. Not really. They need a guy to come in and play well. I mean, a, a leadoff walk would be great for the, the, the Lions in this situation. No, I, I agree 100%, and I'm, I'm with you, BP. I would be happy, man, if I if I get Kool-Aid McKinstry at pick 29. Listen, he had success last year going to Alabama, drafting Brian Branch, right? Go and do the same exact thing. Like I said, as long as he's a defensive player, it's a win. Kool-Aid McKinstry is one of my highest-graded players that's left, but also he's one of my highest-graded cornerbacks. Getting him at pick 29, uh, you should feel really good about that. Yeah, Aaron, Aaron Glenn should be happy. Will be very happy with this pick, right? Getting a pure press man corner, a guy that's very confident at the line of scrimmage, loves to disrupt timing and, and rhythm between wide receiver and and the uh, quarterback. And I, again, this is just a big need for them to to improve this secondary. You are in the uh, the final four, like Matt said. You want to put yourself back in position to get there again, but this time to not blow a lead and to get to the Super Bowl. The Baltimore Ravens are sitting here at pick 30, and they've done such a good job of hanging out late in drafts. They're always a playoff team and just collecting a, a, a stud player, usually a big player, usually an upfront type of guy. Uh, I know we've rattled off a few names here to start this episode of players that are still on the board, guys who might be first round grades or at least, you know, late first, high second round type of players. And uh, one of those guys is Amarius Mims that's still on the board. Uh, Keith, is this a good spot for a Marius Mims? Is this maybe a spot where you go wide receiver with someone with a ton of speed to help the passing game a little bit more as they have transitioned in sort of a new offense there that worked quite well for Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens last year? Yeah, definitely. If you're thinking about what the Baltimore Ravens may do with this pick, right, it's simply going to the draft board and saying, who's the best football player, right? Like just flat out football player on film. And that's usually what they decide to go with. So, yes, I'm, I'm looking at a Marius Mims, right? I'm looking at a potentially productive wide receiver. That's a Keon Coleman. But then I'm also looking at a Kingsley Sumatia, too. I'm, those are the three that I'm, I'm circling because I'm saying, you know what, on film, those are probably the best three football players that we have left right now. Yeah, losing that, if um, went wide receiver here. Do you like a, a Keon Coleman type of power forward? Or are you looking at speed with Xavier Worthy? I think I would drift away from the Zay Flowers type. So I'd probably want a bigger body. You know, they're going to run the football. So blocking's important. That's something mm -hmm. Coleman would do plenty of. It's interesting, though. I think the Ravens are still one of the best teams in the league. But they got hit really hard in free agency. Their O-line got riddled pretty bad. And I think a corner could be in need. I think another receiver, as you mentioned. And it's way too early, but this team needs a running back, too. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think there's more needs on this team than people think. Yeah, I think, you know, offensive line is big, right? You, you mm -hmm. got rid of, I think they were via the trade from Morgan, Mo Morgan Moses to the New York Jets. So that opened up that right tackle situation. Are you co completely comfortable with Daniel Falele coming in and being your long-term starter as a I big guy be. himself? I, I'm not oh, I'm not there, you know. No. I'm not completely there with him being the full-time starter. So I think that right tackle spot, you bring up a Marius Mims, Keon Coleman at receiver, Xavier Leggett still being there. I think they also could look at corner. I think, you know, having a, another outside, you know, guy outside of uh, Marlon Humphrey who plays nickel and outside corner along with Brandon Stevens could be a move uh, for them for them as well. 
They also lost Zeitler, and Ronnie Stanley's never yes. really been the same with that ankle since yep. he signed his contract and got hurt. I mean, th- he didn't even play every snap. They'd rotate him in and out of games last year. So they played a lot of three safety sets last year. You lose Geno Stone to the Good Pittsburgh point. Steelers, right? Now you just have uh, Marcus Williams and Kyle Hamilton, maybe a Tyler Newbin, you know, right here in the back end of the first round where you still can be able to run those three, t- those three safety sets and let Kyle Hamilton play in the nickel like you've been doing all year. So number of ways the Baltimore Ravens could go here at pick number 30 in the pick is in Kevin Ostriker, the host of Locked On Ravens, ready to go in the Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. With the 30th pick in the 2024 Locked On NFL Mock Draft, the Baltimore Ravens select Amarius Mims, offensive lineman from Georgia. Mims stands around 6'8 and weighs around 340 pounds, an absolutely massive human being. And he has everything you look for, for traits in an offensive lineman. He has the size, he has the athleticism. Now, the thing with Mims is experience. Not a ton of experience at Georgia, was slated to take over a key role in that offensive line last year, but injuries limited him a little bit. But in terms of pure potential, some of the highest that this very talented offensive line group has to offer. Mims also very familiar with current Ravens offensive coordinator Todd Munkin during Munkin's days at Georgia. And the Ravens need an offensive lineman. There's no question they've lost three starters. And Mims could be an easy plug-and-play option at the right tackle position after the trade of Morgan Moses to the New York Jets. So, Damien, what are we talking about here when it comes to Amarius Mims? 6'8", 340. He wears his weight so well. Ran 507 at the combine. You shouldn't be able to move that easily when you're that big. But he only started eight games at Georgia. So what kind of a prospect is Mims, and how far is he away for a team like the Ravens? Is he is he a guy you have to stash for a year before he's ready to play? Um, I think pass it wise I'm comfortable with him starting. You know, this season, uh, this is a guy that knows how to use his arm length. I think 36 and some change on the arms. Uh, Measuring at the combine, uh, really smooth in his pass sets. A guy that knows how to protect the outside shoulder, keeps the inside hand free for inside counters. Very strong-handed as well. And when he gets his hands clamped and latched in, he can stop momentum and movement. The big thing for them, for him is the Baltimore Ravens is a run, a running team. They're a balanced team. And he has to work on the footwork in the run game to be able to just be the B68340. You want to see him start mauling guys. And pad level could be a little high. And the foot, the feet, you know, we always said, you know, slow feet don't eat. You got to get the feet moving to, to, to move guys off the spot and create, especially with Derrick Henry in the backfield now and Lamar Jackson, right? But I think for for him, you know, being able to replace Morgan Moses, you know, really toolsy young man that we haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg or the full p- picture for him um, be painted. I think he has a high ceiling, but you got to allow him to get those reps. Similar to Broderick Jones last year, you know, Broderick Jones didn't start the year before, but he had a full year before coming into the draft, right? Before Pittsburgh took him, you know, top, you know, top 25 in the 2023 NFL draft. I think Baltimore is a good fit for him. They'll be able to get him going, you know, being a balanced offense and allow him to get those reps. Matt, we saw a guy, Jordan Mailata, who never played football before, but had this sort of just physical ability and in, in a team took a shot. Now it was the seventh round and not the first round, but we've seen Mims block SEC defenders, right? We've got some tape at least of him. And just to have this sort of ability, there's not that many human beings that can walk around and be a player that you're like, yeah, that's what an offensive tackle in the NFL is supposed to look like. Yeah. I don't have official grades on these guys, but I'm, I can pretty much promise of all the remaining players. He would have been my highest graded player at any position. Obviously, it fits a need as well. And yeah, I'm a little biased being in Pittsburgh, but this division's all about physicality. I mean, look at the tackles the Bengals have now. I mean, they're like 800 pounds between the two of them. You mentioned Jones. The Browns line's always big and physical. I mean, often in the North, the most physical team wins. Well, yeah, and and I'm going to kind of piggyback off of that, Matt. That's why this pick for me is a little bit interesting and is kind of what DP said at the very beginning, but that's why... I'm going to say that I had a second round grade on Amaris Mims, and that's because of the the running, like, you know, his ability to contribute in a run game. And I don't know if it's, it's not necessarily ability, right? We're talking 6'8", 340, right? He has the ability to move people out the way. It's more of a, uh, um, his personal identity, right, and want to. And so I'm hoping that a Baltimore Ravens team, an organization whose identity is physicality, can rub off on him. Because, yeah, I think the ceiling is through the roof, but I think he's much more advanced in pass protection than what he is as a run blocker at this moment. 
certainly some boom or bust despite all of his potential you know so few games played some injuries even pulled up lame at the at the combine too with a hamstring so you got to be on the field to be able to to make that value of a first round pick come through for the team who selects you and Marius Mims to the Baltimore Ravens next We've got the San Francisco 49ers on the clock. I happen to know, working as assistant GM for my co-host, Eric Crocker, Locked On 49ers. He's got the pick next. We we had some conversations about going up, going down. No trades happened, so sticking and picking at 31 next. The San Francisco 49ers on the clock in the Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. The Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for a small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Okay, guys. So the San Francisco 49ers on the clock at pick number 31. Uh, I know where my guy Eric Crocker is going here because I've seen the draft board. I was a part of building this draft board. Uh, I I think we would have gone with Mims, Chop, Kool-Aid, you know, some players that went right in front of where the 49ers selected, and that's why there were some conversations to go up. Um, this is a really good roster. This is a roster with a lot of stars on it, but there are still some needs for you guys Matt, I'll go with you, and we talk football a lot. What direction do you think the 49ers should go And my guy Eric Crocker? What pick should he make here at 31? Yeah, I mean, with Morgan, Guyton, Sumataya all available, and considering the state of the line and Trent Williams' age, I think that's the obvious direction. You know, As you mentioned, BP, you and I talk a lot of football. I know Guyton's not your favorite, so I'm guessing he's not in the mix. Um, a corner wouldn't kill him, and – I would never ever put past ex- any any extra D lineman for the Niners. I mean, they never have enough. You talk about Guyton not being a great fit, Keith. I want to talk to you about this because this is a, a huge thing when it comes to offensive linemen. We talked about the left versus the right, and there's zone and there's gap. And when you're talking about a, a first round tackle, you're probably talking about a guy that can fit a lot of different schemes, but I think with some of the bigger guys, and even Mims is probably in the conversation as, as well as he moves, how big of a factor is that in the NFL for certain players that fit different styles of running games? No, I, I think it's a huge factor, 100%, especially um, when you talk about the athletes, right? Like, what what is their athletic threshold? And sometimes you you have these power guards, right? And you have these power schemes of, you know, we talk about the Cowboys in the 2015, 2016. We talked about the Cleveland Browns, right? It's a certain mode and a certain type of offensive lineman at certain schemes, um, you know, with certain players fit better in in certain schemes. So um, looking at the San Francisco 49ers, I'm looking at them all, right? And that's why, man, I'm, I've been talking about my guy for two episodes episodes now man Kingsley Sumatia right somebody has to draft him because this guy's a mauler and can play both sides of the uh, of the tackle position a lot of versatility a lot of options for Eric Crocker the co-host of Lockdown 49ers ready to go to make the pick at 31 with the 31st overall pick in the 2024 NFL draft the San Francisco 49ers have selected Kingsley Sumatia off the tackle out of BYU The San Francisco 49ers have definitely been trying to figure out a way to improve on this offensive line. And I know I've been one of the big proponents of not forcing it. And they're not having to force this, right? They brought back McKivitz and locked him in for another year. They brought back John Feliciano. So you don't have to force this pick. But I think Kingsley is a good guy right here in this spot. And this is good positional value. Yes, Peacock and I, we try to put our GM caps on move up a little bit and be able to get Mims, but we weren't able to complete a trade 
and the Baltimore Ravens nabbed him at pick 30 right before we picked. So, 49ers land with Kings Lee, Suomataia. We really like this spot, and he really helps the 49ers. There are areas where he can improve, and there are areas of strength. If the 49ers are looking for a big body 6'5", 326 pound offensive tackle, that's a wall and still has room to improve as a pass protector. You got your guy that can help really hold it down for Brock Purdy and protect him from years to come. The situation with Aaron Banks, a guy who, you know, kind of had the rest shirt, right? Like to really figure out how to play 49er brand. Eventually he got it after a year. I think Kingsley Suomataia, it doesn't take that long. And he comes in, steps in right away as an immediate impact guy for your San Francisco 49ers. Croc laid it out there really well. Uh, the 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 thing with Suomataia for me, and by the way, the, he nailed the pronunciation as well. Suomataia, Kingsley, a lot, a lot of really great well in this draft. Um he he's one of the few guys that can stick at tackle. He's got the 34 and a quarter inch arms. You know, he's six five. He he really wears his 325 pounds well, ran 504 at the combine. Um, he's a good athlete and he's not a finished product. So there's some boomer bust, but I feel like there's a little less bust and maybe not quite as high, but still some boom with him versus someone like Amarius Mims. And I like the the I like him over some of those other, you know, Bartons and and Morgan and some other players because I do think Suomataia can stick at tackle. And I think that's really important for the 49ers and for value of gra grabbing a guy here. And you can get some of these interior guys a little bit later on. Now, he could probably play some guard too, but I like him competing right away at right tackle. Maybe even down the road, he could sneak in and play some left tackle after Trent Williams retires. And, and Keith, I know you've been pound the table for Suomataia, so I'm glad that somebody else here in the booth with us uh, likes this pick for the 49ers. If you squint a little bit, if Kingsley Suomataia was across the street and you squint a little bit, he would look an awful lot like his cousin, Pene Sewell. You put their height, weight, speed, workout numbers, 31 reps versus 30 reps at the combine bench press. He's a very similar guy and just a pup. He finished his college season at 20 years old, just turned 21, one of the younger players in the draft as well. Yeah, I didn't know that Panay Sewell was his cousin. So I'll tell you one thing, man. That's one uh, aggressive physical family cookout they have over yeah. there, right? <laughs> but, hey, I, I told you, man, I, I love the pick. I can see him just in training camp um, being one of the stars of the show. This guy's game is physicality. Um, he, he, he borders the line of, you know, getting a little bit dirty with the defenders, but you like that, right? You want an offensive lineman that's going to push the line a little bit, you know, may get you close to the whistle. So I think this is a, in my opinion, he's immediately plug and play player. I, I think he beats out the right tackle that's there and he's going to be ready to roll. He's going to be a 49er for many years to come. And what's funny, you know, mentioning the fact that he's Pene Sewell's uh, cousin is that Pene Sewell has that tackle versatility playing left playing right and so does Kingsley man you know 2022 he played the entire season on the right and then in 2023 he flipped over to the left and for the Niners this is a this is a home run pick for me because when you have Trent Williams at the left side be able to be that blind side protector for Brock Purdy and then you know McKivitz I think Carl talked about bringing him back on the one-year deal that's good to have that veteran there but Kingsley walks right into training camp and immediately challenges him for that starting job to be able to bring the physicality to that run game, continue to, to, to set good edges for Christian McCaffrey to be the best running back in the game. But also that play action game that allows Brock Purdy to be so comfortable to survey the field. This is what you do for your quarterback. You give him two bookend tackles. You give him an offensive line that's going to protect him and get the run game going. VP, you mentioned it real briefly. I just wanted to reiterate it because I always I learned this lesson when I was scouting in the league. I mean, those BYU guys sometimes are five years older than the people they're blocking after a Mormon mission, have three kids, and you know, and this guy's one of the youngest in the league. You know, they're coming into the draft. So I think that's important. Sky's the limit. Uh, for more on what the big BYU lineman brings to the San Francisco 49ers, let's check in with locked on Cougars host Jacob Hatch. Kingsley is a guy that during his time at BYU showed improvement every time it felt like he stepped on the field, albeit uh, just three seasons into his collegiate career. He declared for the NFL draft, and I truly believe his best football is still in front of him. An incredible athlete, nimble on his feet, but an absolutely monster frame to work with and the skill sets that seem to go on forever. This is a young man that the NFL is going to love having in whichever franchise he is in because it just really feels like he is barely reaching his potential 
potential. And if they can really help him realize that full potential, we're talking about a stalwart guy who could start 10 straight years in the NFL. And everybody, don't forget to stick around for a handful of picks post round one here because we've got to hear from the Carolina Panthers, the Texans, the Bills, and the Cleveland Browns who did not have first round picks, assuming that the Kansas City Chiefs stick here at 32. And it looks like they are. Ryan Tracy of Locked On Chiefs is ready to go momentarily with the final selection of round one in this mock draft. Uh, you know, offensive lines, a direction that uh, that they could go in Kansas City here, wide receiver. But it does feel like, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, feels like Kansas City's got to do something to help out uh, help out Patrick Mahomes because the offense wasn't what we were used to seeing in Kansas City. Still good enough to go win a title, which is scary. But, uh, you know, help your superstar quarterback out a little bit. You don't have to spend a lot of money on it, but maybe spend a draft pick, toss a first rounder his way. Yeah, I mean, they did lose Snead, and they've had a lot of success drafting and developing defensive backs lately. But I do think this is an offensive pick. I know the whole planet is like, oh, we can't let Xavier Worthy get to the Chiefs. But you and I talk about this on our show all the time. I'd be more afraid if McConkey went there and, you know, caught 100 balls as opposed to 50, you know. And so I think that's a really good fit. And an underreported story for whatever reason, I thought their offensive tackle play last year was quite poor, to be honest with you. I mean, Donovan Smith isn't back at the moment. They have big money invested in the right tackle. So I think tackle could be very much in play here, too. Yeah, I'll say this, Matt. I'll say Xavier Worthy and Lad McConkey both scare me, right? If I'm a defensive yeah. coordinator, um, and just looking what Patrick Mahomes got it done with last year, you're talking about Rasheed Rice as a, a a rookie, right, stepping in. And I don't think, and if you ask me, I think both of those guys' athletic upside is higher than what she Rice what Rashi Rice's uh -huh. is. And then you throw in a guy like Xavier Leggett, he's still sitting there. So I, all of the NFL should be a little bit nervous right now with the, with the uh with the Kansas City Chiefs having almost their pick of the litter as far as wide receivers and being able to add to Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, cor corner is definitely, you know, losing Snead was big. You still have Trent McDuffie. You got some younger guys, I think Josh Williams, and I think, you know, Watson. They got some young guys behind McDuffie, but you kind of still need to look at cornerback in this draft. But with Don without Donovan Smith, you definitely need to get the tackle, right? You, you, you hoping that, what, Wanye Morris, who you drafted with fourth round last year, mm -hmm. who played right tackle to flip over to the left. He wasn't, when he did play, you know, when we did see him on the field, he wasn't great at, at right tackle. Now you're hoping he's going to be great at left. Absolutely not. I think you got to go in the trenches here and get a tackle that can either go from right to left or play left full time and allow Pat Mahomes to be able to sit in the pocket and not have to be Houdini 24-7. Tackle, corner, wide receiver. Let's find out. Ryan Twait, Ryan Tracy with the pick at 32 for Locked On Chiefs. With the 32nd pick of the Locked On NFL mock draft, the Kansas City Chiefs select Tyler Guyton, offensive tackle, Oklahoma. There's a lot that goes into this pick, and it has been quite a run on the offensive tackle position. With six coming just after the 20th pick of this mock first round, it was a run. And the reason that it came down to this decision is because all of the tier one offensive tackles had come off the board already. And we were nearing the bottom of tier two, a couple of grades that I have in the second round have already gone off the board ahead of this selection. And so it came down to two things, protect Patrick Mahomes and get another tackle to compete for the future along with Wanya Morris or get him another weapon. After the signing of Hollywood Brown, that became just slightly less uh, a priority and the decision came between Keon Coleman who's going to go roughly uh, very very quickly right after this selection possibly Xavier Worthy although I do think he was uh, a little bit farther down the board or this player Tyler Guyton that has the lower body I think to compete in the style that the Chiefs like and that is the athletic tackles that can get out on the edges get in space in the screen game can get vertical sets due to their lower body explosion and nimble traits and maybe have to grow into some of the strength in the upper body. Very reminiscent of what they've liked traditionally. Tyler Guyton fixed the mold, and he's the last guy on the board in the two top tiers of offensive tackles. So we pulled the trigger. Tyler Guyton, offensive tackle out of Oklahoma, is the pick at 32. And uh, Matt, you mentioned it. I like Suamata Ia more. Uh, there's a, a lot of tackles I like more, maybe for the 49ers, maybe for a lot of teams. I, I do like Guyton for the Chiefs a little bit more, but... There was something odd about his tape, and he kind of upright sometimes. He's a former tight end. While you'd think he's a super athlete because of 
him being a, a former tight end. There, there was just something missing on tape. What did you see from Tyler Guyton? What do you think of his fit for the Kansas City Chiefs? I think he's a work in progress. I think he can stand to get a little stronger. His technique still needs some work. I mean, everyone talks about Mims being unrefined without a lot of uh, practice or a lot of time on the field. Well, Oklahoma just had two tackles drafted last year, too. I mean, like, he hasn't had as much experience as you'd like, but I do think he has enough up upside to be a not upper tier, but middle to upper tier starting right or left tackle before long. Damian. What is the upside for Tyler Guyton and and what work does he need to do to find that? And is he a starting tackle for those Kansas City Chiefs? Because uh, when it comes to Patrick Mahomes and protecting him, we talked about it before the pick. I mean, I think it's the right way to go for Kansas City here. Yeah, I think what Matt said, you know, about strength, right? Being able to anchor quicker, you know, when guys try to convert speed to power, keeping his hands a little bit higher, not being as low as they that they are on tape. Uh, you know, he looked he looked fairly good in reps, you know, down in Mobile, but you know, allowing guys to get hands on, especially power rushers like a Darius Robinson, be able to get their hands into his chest, control them, and be able to push pull technique, and just kind of opens them up to those physical counters where you can be quickly displaced. And now you put your right handed quarterback, if you're playing left tackle, really open because you're the blind side protector, right? He doesn't feel that pressure coming. So I think just working on getting stronger, getting into an NFL weight program, uh, be able to drop that anchor when guys do want to try and bull rush and power through him. But he is an athletic young man. He has uh, the physical tools, the arm length. He looks good on the huff. Uh, but some technical things, and then like, like Matt said, the power and functional strength uh, needs to improve. Let's check in with the draft dudes. Kyle Krabs and Joe Marino have locked on NFL scouting for their analysis on the final four selections of the first round. Joe, closing out the first round, a couple of very successful campaigns from 2023 looking to carry over into 2024. Detroit drafting cornerback Kool-Aid McKinstry from Alabama. Baltimore drafting a replacement for Morgan Moses on their offensive line with Amarius Mims from University of Georgia. San Francisco addressing their offensive line with Kingsley Suamata'ia from BYU. And the Kansas City Chiefs with another offensive tackle, Tyler Guyton, that Oklahoma pipeline coming up clutch again for the Chiefs on the offensive line. I like this batch of picks a lot. I think with the recent news with Cam Sutton, the, the need at corner is pretty clear for Detroit. And you and I have been studying Detroit, I mean, always, but especially this offseason. We feel like that roster is really coming together. Yeah, man. And um, I think adding another That's dynamic awesome. talent in Kool-Aid is going to be a nice pick for them. I like this pick of Amarius Mims for Baltimore because I think the story with Mims is obviously unbelievably talented, just inexperienced. I think the lack of pressure to play him right away, given Ronnie Stanley, and of course, I feel like they want to find a spot for Patrick McCarry there at right tackle. They can take the, the slow approach with Mims and still eventually have what I think could be an outstanding starter. I like the 49ers going offensive line, and I think that they've subscribed to this philosophy of just kind of getting by. They got their left tackle, their dude, and Trent Williams. He's the best. But then it's like, all right, can we just get by with the rest of it? I thought that cost them in the Super Bowl. I thought that the, the Chiefs really won that that battle of of that Chiefs defensive line against that San Francisco offensive line. So I, I like to see them adding there and and you know finding ways to get more dynamic. And then of course you have the the Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs going back to that Oklahoma pipeline that's given them Creed Humphrey and of course Wanye Morris, who might be their answer at right tackle down the line if they want to move on from Juwan Taylor. You get a high upside guy in Tyler Guyton. I think this is a great way to close out the round. I think the thing that stands out for Baltimore, San Francisco, and Kansas City is if you're going to address the offensive line, it was now or never. With how the, the run went for offensive tackles, that's obviously the premium position. That's where everyone wants to get better. That's where you want to have cheap contracts and, and getting rookie contracts for those players if they hit for you is a big, big, big win. But with just how much offensive line value, in spite of how good of an offensive line class this is, by the time it gets back to y'all again, you weren't going to see options on the board that you felt like could step in and be contributors for, for you from the jump unless it was a, a Goldilocks situation. So I think being cognizant of what the run was in the first round is a very important context for these three offensive tackles to close the first round. Great point by the guys there about those tackles. I mean, uh, maybe some boomer bust, some projects there, but physically talented guys, certainly worth first round picks three in a row offensive tackles to end round one. We'll see if the run continues into round two. 
The first round is in the books, but don't worry. We are your team every day here at Locked On, so we still have the first picks for the Carolina Panthers, the Houston Texans, the Buffalo Bills, and the Cleveland Browns up next on the 2024 Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. I've been told I'm a competitive person, and yeah, I do have a competitive side. We all do, and my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times, and it's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part is messing with your friends, and I can charge them rent on my Iconic properties, just like classic Monopoly, but now I can also rob their vaults of riches for myself. And the leaderboards show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play. On to pick 33 in this mock draft, guys, and it is the Carolina Panthers with the first pick in round two that are on the clock. Then it'll be the Houston Texans. We'll find out who their selection at 42, the Bills at 45, and the Cleveland Browns at 54. Uh, what do you get the team that needs everything, Matt? The Carolina Panthers are on the clock here at 33 and um, you know trade away more pieces on the defense this year, do you help out your quarterback? Do you help out the defense? What directions do you go if you're Carolina? Yeah, I mean, they were the worst team in the league for a reason. They need a lot. And, I mean, I do give them credit. There hasn't been a lot of moves I've approved of at the time, to be honest with this organization. But I do give them credit that they changed – well, they allowed some defensive people to walk in order to at least see what Bryce Young can do. They spent a lot of money on guards. They tried for Deontay Johnson. You know, I mentioned Young. He's a smaller, very, very small quarterback in, in the Saints fashion. Maybe they grab a Zach Frazier here so that they can have that tight pocket. You know, and the Saints spent more money on guards and centers than anybody in the league with a shorter quarterback. Another receiver wouldn't be frowned upon. And there's not much on defense I would shy away from either. They got hit pretty hard on defense. Guys, who's the best player left here as we as we start round two? Man, that's tough, right? Best player. It's real interesting. I'll say this. Best fit. I, I look at two wide receivers, man. Matt talked about how they address some of the offensive line play, right? And then plus Iki Ikuanu. I think your best draft pick is finding someone that could develop Iki Ikuanu, right? And make sure you have a left tackle. Then outside of that is going to get a wide receiver, man. And we keep talking about it. Xavier Leggett, Keon Coleman is sitting right there for the taking. Potentially a, a lad McConkey, right? If they feel like they want a quick separator for Bryce Young, some of the things he did at Alabama, get him one of those style wide receivers. So I look at those three wide receivers receivers that I feel like they need to draft. Yeah, after Deontay Johnson, you don't know what you really have in Jonathan Mingo and to be your big body wide receiver. Um, and they kind of put him in a role that I don't think he was going to really excel in on the outside as like a true X, where you look at a Keon, Xavier Leggett, those guys could do that. Or Xavier Worthy to bring the speed uh, to kind of take the top off, this de off the defense, right? keep two safeties back, try and open up more of the field for Bryce to be able to just be that point guard and distribute the ball. The pick is in. Julian Council ready to go. Locked on Panthers pick number 33 in the Locked on NFL mock draft special. With the 33rd overall pick in the 2024 NFL Draft, Carolina Panthers select Keon Coleman, wide receiver, Florida State. Why will the Panthers do this? Well, I know there's a lot of people out there who apparently are low on Keon Coleman. I don't know where this came from. This is a guy who burst on the scene in college football last year with three touchdowns against an LSU team. Granted, the secondary was not good, but an LSU team that was thought of as a potential national championship tender contender. Keon Coleman was on an outstanding Florida State team that was absolutely snubbed at the end of the season, but was completely loaded. In the biggest games of the season against Clemson in an ACC title game, he showed up. He has a great size, great speed, was one of the top returners in college football this past season. You turn on the tape. 
you see an outstanding player. The Carolina Panthers are still in desperate need of a number one wide receiver, and I believe Keon Coleman can do that. Is he the best route runner? No, but that's why you got to coach him up. Is he somebody who's going to get immediate separation right now? Maybe not, but I know he's somebody you can throw the ball up to. He can come down with it. It's not a 50-50 ball, y'all. It's an 80-20 ball, a 70-30 ball at the very least. Keon Coleman is a difference maker, and anyone who actually watches college football and watch the games understands that the uh, measurables, the combine, all the other nonsense, who cares? Keon Coleman can ball. He's some of the Carolina Panthers be targeting. And his wide receiver and going with the big bodied wide receiver, Keon Coleman out of Florida State. Damian, he talked about some of the negatives and why some people are maybe down on him. Is Keon indeed the baller that the Carolina Panthers needed at 33? I think so. I think so, man. You put him at, you know, we talk about, you know, Deontay Johnson being that route runner, that separator, that guy that can win on the outside and win one-on-one, right? He could play the X or the Z. And when you look at Keon, Keon moved all over Michigan State's defense. I mean, offense, he played all three wide positions, X, slot, and Z. So you're talking about the football IQ, knowing how to win from all three spots, how to run routes from all three spots and get open, but sure-handed, could play at the catch point. He's an accuracy extender, a guy that you'd watch the Clemson game, right? Being able to go above and above the rim and play basketball, play that power forward role. And he's outstanding at the catch point. At the end of the day, you don't, like I said, you don't know what you have in Jonathan Mingo. You don't know what he's going to become. And truthfully, this would be the second time they've had a, a situation like this where Jonathan Mingo may be going into his Terrace Marshall Jr. year where it's time to step up or we move you out and Keon Coleman can step in play the big slot, the power slot, or be that X receiver and give Bryce Young another reliable weapon. Yeah, I, I can't think of another prospect or somebody on that Florida State team that um, Jordan Travis being hurt affected their draft stock. I just think that if Keon Coleman would have finished strong, had some 100-yard games, right, cracked that 1,000-yard mark, then I think the – the how people feel about him would have changed right but i think as jordan travis got hurt it became an out of sight out of mind situation obviously the nfl combine didn't help with the 40 time but he proved that he's an explosive player with the jumps the broad jump and the vertical jump so i like keon coleman here i love the mentality of the player matt enough separation for a young quarterback with you know mingo that's not really his game you kind of manufacture some touches for him and keon coleman's maybe a 50 50 guy on the outside is there enough is there going to be enough guys running open for a young quarterback to find those targets probably not <laughs> i mean they still have a long way to go I, I i have no qualms with the pick for all the reasons these guys said he's a lot different than deontay i think he's worth this pick it, it's just this team in this passing game was just really, really bad. I mean, if they could take a step forward, that's enough for me. And not, you know, not have any problem with the way you phrased it, but it's it's not going to be ideal for, for Young at all. I mean, it's going to be far from a good environment. I'm just hoping it's better than last year. It's I better. think the big thing with him, guys, is he's going to have to develop those trust throws. And it's something yeah. that I've, I've seen – with the Alabama quarterbacks from him to Mac Jones to Tua, they're used to guys separating on grass and not the big body guys. Those trust throws when you have a 6'3", six, 6'4", six, wide receiver, they're paramount. And that's not something that they're used to and accustomed to at Bama. So Bryce Young, you're going to have to develop that trust to say, you know what, Keon Coleman, let me throw this back shoulder fade to you. Let me throw the 50-50 ball to you because I trust you to turn that 50-50 into an 80-20. And if he can't make those throws, then that's another conversation that needs to be had. Vinny Iyer is the co-host of Locked On Fantasy Football, and he's here to give us some more insights and thoughts on Keon Coleman's fantasy impact in Carolina. By taking former Florida State wide receiver Keon Coleman with their first selection of the 2024 NFL Draft early in the second round, the Panthers would continue their commitment to upgrading their weapons around second-year quarterback Bryce Young, last year's number one overall pick. The team already traded for former Steeler Deontay Johnson to add some veteran support for Adam Thielen, but the selection of Coleman suggests the team isn't high on either Jonathan Mingo or Terrace Marshall Jr. in the new offense of coach Dave Canales. At 6'3", 213 pounds, Coleman profiles at first as a perimeter number two with field stretching ability. In Carolina, Johnson will likely hold down the X spot in Canales' 11 personnel three wide sets, with Coleman settling into the Z role and Thielen serving as the big slot. This offense should transition to more downfield passing opportunities. 
Although Coleman's presence would help Young put up more respectable numbers and give Johnson and Thielen better coverage exploitation opportunities, the Panthers aren't the most desirable situation for Coleman to have immediate fantasy football impact. He should be considered as a deep draft flyer in redraft leagues with more intrigue and dynasty given Adam Thielen is near the end of his career. All right, we've heard from the Carolina Panthers now, guys. Uh, you had some thoughts, Matt, on, on the quarterback spot there and, and how that all works together? Yeah, I mean, just from a fantasy angle, I do think Coleman's attractive in Dynasty. I, I mean, Deontay Johnson's only on a one-year deal, too. That could look a lot different. Um, but even for this year, we've seen rookie receivers come in and put numbers up, and they don't have a great pass-catching tight end. They don't have a great pass-catching running back. I mean, is it crazy to think Coleman ends up with the second most targets on the team? I think that's possible. Maybe some throwing from behind, some uh, yeah, you know, yeah. double-digit touchdowns even potentially. Red zone targets. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's get to the rest of day two. We've got some more picks to finish up this extravaganza that is the Locked On NFL Mock Draft special here in 2024. Next up, we've got the picks from John Hickman of Locked On Texans at pick 42. 45 is where Joe Marino now sits with Locked On Bills. And to finish it up, it is Jeff Lloyd, the host of Locked On Browns, making his selection for Cleveland at 54. And with the 42nd pick, the Houston Texans select Xavier Worthy, wide receiver, University of Texas. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. The Houston Texans struggled last year with getting guys open and creating separation, so much so during the first week of the NFL Combine, both head coach D'Amico Ryans and general manager Nick Casario placed an emphasis on getting guys that can, quote-unquote, get open and create separation. And we know that with Xavier Worthy, though he did not have an opportunity to show that on a consistent basis due to quarterback play up and down from Quinn Uris at the University, University of Texas, we know that he can get open. We know that he has blazing speed, so much so he has the fastest 40 time in combine history. That's right. So with his speed and his ability to create separation, you can possibly look at the tandem the trio of Nick, Nico Collins, Tank Dale, and Xavier Worthy. You have Tank Dale and Xavier Worthy who will be two interchangeable players, two guys that played around either in the city of Houston or close to the city of Houston, UT and Austin, two guys that can get open traditionally as inside-outside guys. And with the blazing speed that he brings, you're looking at a player that can either A, have home run shots where you're looking down the field, a guy for a 60 bomb TD, or just a guy when you need him to be pressed and get open for 10 or so yards. That's exactly what he can do. With the 45th pick in the locked on NFL mock draft, the Buffalo Bills select Chris Jenkins, defensive tackle, Michigan. Folks, the board was a disaster for us at pick 28. So we are thrilled to not only land. Chris Jenkins, but to trade out of that selection, which gives us pick 45 that we turned into Chris Jenkins, that gives us a 2025 second round pick. And we get Trevor Penning, who was a first round pick just two years ago, has not really developed for the New Orleans Saints, but we're going to give him to Aaron Cromer, our outstanding offensive line coach. We're going to move him to guard and see if we can find another answer for our offensive line with all the talent that he has in terms of size and athleticism and physicality. It's just about getting the technique down. Cromer can get that figured out. But how about Chris Jenkins, a great addition to this Buffalo Bills defensive line, a defensive line that needs to make more of an impact, especially in those playoff games. And Chris Jenkins, if you watch him in that national championship game, he was dominant. He showed up in the biggest of stages for that national championship team that Michigan had, an undefeated team. And he's a guy with just so much upside, with length, with power, with technique. He's got so much to unlock. He's got the NFL bloodlines with his father being a two-time All-Pro, four-time Pro Bowler. He can pair with Ed Oliver to give this team disruption in the middle of that defensive line. They can be more versatile with their fronts. Defensive line, defensive tackle, a big need for the Buffalo Bills. They fill it with Chris Jenkins, and they turn pick 28 into not only Chris Jenkins, but another second-round pick in 2025 and 
a young offensive lineman and Trevor Penning for Aaron Cromer to develop. With the 54th pick in a locked on NFL mock draft, the Cleveland Browns select Mike Hall, defensive tackle from The Ohio State University. The Browns learned in 2023 just how important the value of interior defensive line play is. The group was really, really solid. They re-signed Maurice Hurst. They re-signed Shelby Harris. They signed Quinton Jefferson. But the fact of the matter is there is no longevity to the Cleveland Browns defensive tackle room. Mike Hall can help them have a player come in here for four seasons. Hall had nice production, not great production in his time at Ohio State. A very athletic player, showed well at his pro day, was an athlete all the way back, played at basketball as well in his days at Streetsboro, Ohio. Hall, it, with his time at Ohio State, was rotated in and out, left school early, and started on his draft path. He is 21 years old, which the Cleveland Browns will like. You cannot just think that the Browns are going to hand Siaki Ika a roster spot. Dalvin Tomlinson is here. He is the top player in that room right now, but they're depth behind it, and especially in the years to come, needs to be enhanced. Mike Hall is the selection at pick 54 from The Ohio State University. So the Texans and the Browns staying in state with their selections in uh, the second round of this mock draft, guys. And uh, I, I want to get your guys' thoughts on the second round and then your winners from uh, from the first round of the Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. But, Matt, looking at these picks in the second round, can we just do a, a trade here and get worthy to the Buffalo Bills and then the defensive tackle over to the Houston Texans after they traded Malik Collins away? I think those would be better fits for the Texans and the, the Bills uh, personally. And it, it'd be tough to get through 45 picks here for the Buffalo Bills and not draft a wide receiver. No, 100%. And I think that would make a ton of sense. Um, one thing about the Bills that I wanted to throw out is they got hit hard in free agency too. They have a very expensive quarterback. They're they're kind of rebooting things in this era of Josh Allen, like Mahomes after the Tyreek trade. Picking up that extra second round pick is important for them. Yeah, I'll I'll go with the Houston Texans also. Um, I, I like what they did, just doubling down, tripling down, right? Post Stefan Diggs trading out his wide receiver core, we can argue is probably the most explosive in the NFL. And I'm like, hey, if you feel like you were right there on the cusp of winning, you know, the AFC or going to the AFC championship, why not get some more explosive weapons to add into that? And you get the fastest guy to ever run a 40 or dash in NFL combine history. So I, I like it. Continue to invest into CJ Stroke. Yeah, the Texans also, you know, with that trade reworked Stefan Diggs deal. He's only basically there for a year and he probably he hits free agency. We got to see what that happens. So I understand planning ahead by getting Diggs, but I love Michael Hall to the Cleveland Browns. The reason why is because getting that interior pass rush, Miles Garrett has been one of the most double teamed players in the league at the end, and they flip him from both sides. He rushes from the left and from the, from the right. It doesn't really matter. They still slide protection his way. And eventually, well, I'm saying out the, out the gate, you know, day one, but somewhere during the season, teams are going to realize on third down, as much as I want to double team Miles Garrett, well, Michael Hall being so quick and agile and fluid to be able to throw different moves at interior offensive linemen, he's one of the more athletic guys in this class lining up as a three-tech one-on-one. You give him enough one-on-one -on -one opportunities, he's going to get right into the face of your quarterback, and that's the quickest way to your quarterback. You're going to start thinking about some things because you also have Darius Smith you have to worry about. I love adding more, uh, more talent, depth, and pass rush ability to this vaunted defensive front. All right, Matt, back to you then. Who won this mock draft? What, what were your favorite picks in round one? Two pass catchers landing spots I was quite fond of, and that's Brock Bowers landing with Sean Payton. I think there's a lot you can do with him schematically. And Brian Thomas with the Colts. I mean, just if he's even a take-the-top-off guy for now with Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson running the football behind a good line, I think that is a lot of value right off the bat. Yeah, I'm going to double down on you, Matt, with the Brian Thomas situation. I think it's a perfect situation for um, a perfect need for a team, right? Just a vertical threat to take the top off. And then the other one is going to be a pass catcher also. That's the Atlanta Falcons and Malik Neighbors, man. I love mm -hmm. that trio that they have now. And even if you have Kirk Cousins for a year or two, right, when you go get your young quarterback, you're going to have so many offensive pieces around him that it should be a really good situation, a la what happened with Brock Purdy, right, and being able to plug and play that guy into a good situation. I'm, I'm gonna go Chicago Bears getting Caleb Williams getting your new quarterback is a given 
and then getting another edge rusher, right? We saw the, the, the impact and effect of Montez Sweat. Now you put another guy on the opposite side of that where now you it's hard to just slide coverage 24-7 two ex explosive downhill guys that can get after the quarterback. J.J. McCarthy is going to be a rookie, more than likely starting majority of his rookie year with the Minnesota Vikings out of this mock. You got Jordan Love, right? You have Jared Goff. Well, Jared Goff's not the most mobile guy. We know what we saw what happened when you pressure him. You know, BP, you know a little bit about that from the playoffs. When you get pressure on, on Jared Goff, you can kind of rattle some things. And I think that's how you set yourself up. This defense, I think Matt said it early in this series, that defense for the Chicago Bears looked really good down the stretch. You add a guy like Dallas Turner opposite the Montez Sweat. You got some good corners in the back end. Jalen Johnson um, and, and the, the second-year player, Tariq Stevenson. You are really – and then with those linebackers they paid last offseason – this defense with Matt Eberflus to take another step forward with also an improved offense as well. And can I shout out Ross Jackson, the host of Locked On Saints, does a ton of work on this network behind the scenes, a ton of work on this mock draft behind the scenes, and he was working for the Saints to get a couple of picks, not just one, trading back into the first round to really good, versatile, long-term starters, I think, in Troy Faltanu and Darius Robinson in this mock draft. But, of course, uh, the best pick of, of the entire first round was at 31, Eric Crocker's pick in, for the San Francisco 49ers. Kingsley Sewell, Latia. Great job, Croc. All right, before we go, the draft dudes have some thoughts on day two. Joe Marino and Kyle Krabs of Locked On NFL Scouting give their team-building analysis on our final selections of this Locked On NFL mock draft special. Not every team picked in the first round, but we certainly have every team covered here on the Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special. At pick 33, the Carolina Panthers get Keon Coleman, the wide receiver from Florida State. Pick 42, the Houston Texans, another explosive wide receiver for C.J. Stroud, Xavier Worthy. Heading there from Texas, the Buffalo Bills get Chris Jenkins, the defensive tackle from Michigan, and another defensive tackle going to the Cleveland Browns at pick 54, Michael Hall Jr. from Ohio State from Buckeye to Brown. Kyle, a couple wide receivers, a couple of defensive tackles. What stands out to you in this batch? Yeah, I think these these two wide receivers, very different players, right? I think that that's the fun thing about the wide receiver position is just how dramatically different the body types and the skill sets can be where uh, you have a player in Keon Coleman who elevates, goes up and gets the football and can win down the field as a big body type player. And you contrast that with Xavier Worthy being a, four two one speed home run hitter and you think about that with tank dale and then what they have in size with nico collins uh, i think you you put worthy at their traditional z alignment and you you have nico collins at the traditional x alignment and you have tank dell in the slot and you get a lot of problems especially when you consider they got a pass catcher at tight end too so i'm over the moon for worthy to houston i think that's an outstanding fit I think that creates a lot more math problems for trying to cover the field against C.J. Stroud and that Houston Texans offense. And I like both these defensive tackle picks. Obviously, 45 Chris Jenkins to the Buffalo Bills. I think there's so much untapped potential with Chris Jenkins, with his length, with his athleticism, with his technique. I think you can really have some fun things going on with him and Ed Oliver at that defensive tackle position. And maybe the Bills could even be more multiple with their fronts if they wanted to do some more odd front stuff, playing him as a four-eye. And that way you can get Daquan Jones and Ed Oliver and Chris Jenkins on the field together. But I really like Michael Hall, this defensive lineman from Ohio State going to Cleveland where he might be a little bit lean, but what he makes up or, you know, he lacks in mass. He makes up for in length and technique. He knows how to beat blocks. He's very smart in terms of his processing and recognition skills. I think there's some some more playmaking upside that exists with him than we even saw at Ohio State. You know, I always watch players, and then I go back and look at their box score. I was stunned that Michael Hall didn't have more yeah. production because the, when I watched him play, it felt like he was making play after play. Uh, so I think for these teams not having picks in the first round, for them to get these prospects, you can see how they got some value and really address some needs in a meaningful way. Well, yeah, and I think the same goes for Chris Jenkins, right? I think he, he took a major step forward with his play this year. If you watch the national championship, you would assume this guy would be a top 20 pick. I mean, he yeah. he was lights out against Washington. Those defensive tackles helped win them that football game. And uh, I think the light bulb's only starting to come on for him and for Michael Hall as far as being complete football players. And this defensive tackle class is a little bit deeper than I think the first assumptions were with players like this that are, are good values here in the second round. 
And that's it. We did it, guys. The 2024 Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special is in the books. All six episodes. Big thank you to everybody working behind the scenes to get this thing done. Uh, we had so much fun bringing it to you. A big thank you to the folks with me every step of the way. Matt, Damian, Keith had such a good time talking all with you guys over the course of six episodes of this thing. And don't forget, you can find the entire special on both audio and video at the Peacock and Williamson NFL show, Locked On NFL Draft, Locked On NFL Scouting, and Locked On NFL Podcast Feeds for Matt Williamson, Damian Parson, Keith Sanchez. I'm Brian Peacock, and that'll do it. We'll see you next year for the Locked On NFL Mock Draft Special, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.